wherever humans gather, we're going to have conflict. It's just a part of the human experience. Most of us have been kind of conditioned to avoid it or to be nervous about it or to think conflict is a bad thing. And I think the more we just normalize that conflict is normal and that we need a process to navigate it so that people come through that um, come through that conflict uh, with relationships intact and with the ability to work productively and collaboratively and creatively together, the more we just um, kind of support this, uh, you know, reality that conflict is a normal part of the human experience. Just what isn't a part of the normal human experience is inherently or instinctively knowing how to navigate it well. Good morning, HR. I'm Mike Coffey, president of Imperative, premium background checks with fast and friendly service. And this is the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. Please follow, rate, and review Good Morning HR wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at goodmorninghr.com. In last week's HR News episode, Holly Novak and I spent a lot of time discussing workplace conflicts. Resolving conflict is one of the key skills every people leader should have, but many seem to lack. Is the ability to mediate between parties a personality trait that either you have or you don't have, or is it a skill that can be taught to people leaders and perhaps even frontline employees? To help me explore this, Dr. Robin Short is returning as a guest on the podcast. Robin is an organization systems design consultant, peace building trainer, and mediator with expertise in restorative practices and transformative mediation models. She's the founder of the Workplace Peace Institute, which she created to help organizations create highly engaged workplaces where dignity is consistently honored and experienced. She is also the founder and publisher of Good Media Press, an independent book publisher with a mission to promote peace and social justice through books and other media. Welcome back to Good Morning HR, Robin. Thank you, Mike. It is so great to be here. Let's start with definitions. What is mediation and is there a special definition of it inside the workplace? Is it different than what we hear about when you're involved in litigation or other things? Well, I don't think that the process is different. You know, mediation is a dialogue process that brings in a third party neutral to support individuals in coming to a resolution to, you know, a disagreement that they're experiencing. Um, The mediation that I do really specifically is focusing on disputes and, um, Uh, conflicts that are personality related when two or more people are struggling to get along in the workplace, and that's actually causing disruption in the organization. So I typically do non-litigated mediation, and um, I think that that's kind of important to take note of because litigated mediation is usually parties are splitting up and they're coming to some form of an agreement about what that split up looks like. And um, in workplace mediation, we have parties who are staying together, that this is an ongoing relationship and we need to find a way to transcend the conflict to create a, a more productive path forward. So you're more of a marriage counselor than a divorce attorney. Correct. <laughs> that is a great way of looking at it. And it's primarily useful when we're dealing with personality conflicts and disagreements rather than performance management issues? Well, it can be both. It can absolutely be um, performance management. I would say though that mediate so so when I'm brought in to do mediation, there are more parties involved. So a performance management issue could be impacting other parties and conflict is surfacing as it relates to that. Um, but I'm thinking about mediation as a skill. So you have like mediation skills and you have mediation process. Mediation as a skill, I think those skills can absolutely be um, implemented and can be really crucial in performance management conversations. Okay. So, yeah. And I mean, 
if you know if we're going to play the good morning HR drinking game, everybody can take a drink because I'm about to beat my dead horse about how we hire managers. Uh, we promote people into management roles without giving them the skills to do it. Uh, and, you know, they were a great accountant, so um, that uh, means they'll be a great manager, and that's usually not the case without training and guidance and coaching. Uh, so, but what you're saying is that ability to um, mediate between parties or to even have a productive conversation with an employee who maybe isn't performing at the right level uh, is, is something that, uh, you know, where mediation could, could come into play as well, uh, that same skill set. Mediation, you know, when people go through mediation training, they learn a lot about self-awareness, biases that they're bringing into conversations, conflict styles, um, how to have difficult conversations, how to cultivate psychological safety in a conversation when people need to have hard, you know, kind of hard conversations that um, kind of defy the 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 norms of of you know the way we're just conditioned to communicating uh, with one another in the workplace. All of these are really critical skills. We also, in mediation training, are learning how to get at the underlying root of a conflict, kind of separating what we are sort of positionally arguing about and what people's underlying interests are. I think really at its core, mediation as a skill is helping people really cultivate what I think of as as being more human humans, really learning the proficiencies of human behavior and how to navigate um, difficult human behaviors and why those human behaviors are showing up. All of these are critical management skills and very few people much less leaders have actually gone through any formal training to to learn those very specific skills. I think based off of a person's upbringing and social conditioning and personality, some people may just inherently be better at these things than others. Um, I think we tend to call those people natural born leaders. Um, but they're skills that managers really need to have. Mediators have gone through that training, and it's it's part of what makes the mediation process uh, what I think of as just kind of magical, because people are able to have the experience of really being seen, really being heard, and having um, a person drive the conversation or facilitate the conversation in such a way that they come to a better, deeper understanding of themselves and a deeper understanding of the conflict itself. And so, yes, I think all of these are really important leadership skills that will support managers when they're having performance related conversations and when they're having difficult conversations, but also when they're just having relationship building conversations. It'll support them in being um, more effective in leading team meetings and facilitating problem solving meetings. And um, when managers are trained in mediation skills, I think they actually can cultivate a work environment where people experience less disruptive conflict. So give me some examples of workplace situations where mediation would be the appropriate response versus some other form of corrective action? Sure. So let's, let me talk first about um, uh, kind of internal mediation and then bringing in an outside party to do the mediation. Okay. Um, I, I think it would be really beneficial if all managers and all HR professionals actually went through formal mediation training so that they could step in and be a third party neutral to workplace conflict. Um, supporting uh, that environment from uh, having conflicts escalate to the level where you need to bring in an outside mediator. So these would be um, like peer to peer mediation. 
when you have someone on hand that can be called in and say, I'm having a conflict uh, here, can you support us in navigating this conflict? I think you can also have peer-to-peer mediation supporting difficult processes like uh, strategic planning and um, budget development when you have a lot of people who have various interests and you're trying to bring all of these interests together into some kind of cohesive plan. And then you have some conflicts that have escalated to the point where you do need to bring in a third party neutral because you need the process itself to be confidential, where a um, a conflict has escalated to the point where people don't feel psychologically safe coming to HR because they don't want the conflict itself to kind of get embedded into their personnel file and to impact their employment status in any way. And so bringing Bringing in a third party neutral to support them in that process keeps everything that is said in mediation confidential. And then the only thing that's brought back to HR or to the team, you know, lead would be the final agreement that is um, that is uh, that that is the result of the mediation itself. So I've been brought in for. Um, It's really interesting. Usually people call me to come in and mediate when a conflict has gotten so escalated that uh, the company is contemplating terminating someone, but they really don't want to terminate anyone because all of the individuals involved are really crucial to the business, but it's just become uh, unsustainable, the conflict. And so I'll come in and support them and and then come to some kind of relationship agreement that helps them build a productive relationship moving forward. I do have a client, um, and this is really exciting to me because I think it's very progressive and very proactive, who calls me in for, I'm, I'm not on retainer, but it's almost like I'm on retainer. I get called in to support them at Uh, conflicts that have not escalated to that level. So they're using mediation as a tool to prevent conflicts from from really getting to that level where it's beginning to shut down productivity. And, um, and it's really, and that is really exciting to me because people are becoming, um, it's really normalizing the process of mediation. Um, but scenarios in which uh, people have brought us in for mediation have been around um, uh, uh, partners who are um, having some kind of uh, personality dispute that is rippling into how you know effectively the organization itself is able to function. Um, mediations around it, it's usually just conflicts that are associated with people having different needs from their work environment, whether that's different needs from their colleagues as it relates to relationship and how they work together, or different understandings about um, their role in the organization and how they're, and how they are, um, how they're expected to um, engage with their, with their work and with leadership. Um, And then that is causing conflict, you know, to disrupt, uh, workplace productivity. Usually when I get called in, it's a conflict that has gotten so big that it's shutting down productivity. People are actually not able to get their work done, which means the conflict itself is becoming very costly. I expect a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of employers look at the cost of bringing an outside mediator in as a straight cost versus doing nothing and no cost. But they're not measuring the cost of productivity, the cost of empl- losing this key employee uh, mm-hmm. and employee dissatisfaction and lack of engagement. All those softer costs that are harder to measure but are a lot more expensive, I'm sure, than, than bringing in you know, a, a third party mm-hmm. uh, for these higher stakes conversations. Absolutely. Um, mediation is usually going to cost somewhere between $3,500 and $5,000. Um, to me, it's a no-brainer when you think about um, the cost associated with 
protracted conflicts that are causing people to not be able to work together, the tension that surfaces with teammates around other people's conflicts, how people will avoid one another, the inability to get work done. And then to your point, actually people leaving the organization and the cost of, um, of uh, you know, rehiring and retraining and onboarding new talent can be um, obviously so much more costly than than just bringing people together for mediation. So when we're doing the internal mediation, where it's somebody internal uh, who's acting as the mediator, is that typically somebody in HR, or what do you see organizations doing about who gets? Who they who's that third party that comes in to enter in between these uh, these parties in conflict? It it often very much is HR, and um, and I think that that's you know an absolutely appropriate approach, and I think that HR obviously needs to have mediation skills. I think um, it can sometimes be a, people can be a little bit nervous to come to HR and to utilize HR in that way because of the visibility that their conflict then, you know, it kind of exposes their conflict. I have worked with organizations who used what they called an agent model, where they had people in the organization that in addition to their regular job, they were called an agent. And that agent went through mediation training. And so people could call on an agent to come in and do a peer-to-peer mediation. And, um, and I think that's a really progressive approach because it keeps the, um, the conflict exposure pretty low and people feel safe coming to a peer to support them with that conflict because they aren't worried about it um, People have a lot of concern about their conflict being, you know, associated with with their performance um, history and with their personnel file. Yeah, I can imagine it depends a lot on company culture, uh, the higher trust that somebody has in the organization and and their past experiences, especially with HR and leadership doing what it says, um, probably make a big impact on how much you trust HR or any probably any internal mediator who's certified by the company to be the mm-hmm. you know the mediator. Yes, and people often also feel um, a little bit embarrassed that their conflict has has risen to the level that a mediator needs to come in to the organization. And so I do think that the more um, people you're able to train in mediation and the more you're able to leverage a peer-to-peer mediation system, um, the more normalized it will be when the organization decides to bring in a third-party mediator. Or if um, the organization has a mediator um, on retainer so that uh, so that employees can access the third party mediator um, when co- when conflicts are at the low level before they've really surfaced to something that's really escalated. And I, I just really, it, it excites me when organizations normalize conflict. Wherever humans gather, we're going to have conflict. It's just a part of the human experience. Most of us have been kind of conditioned to avoid it or to be nervous about it or to think conflict is a bad thing. And I think the more we just normalize that conflict is normal and that we need a process to navigate it so that people come through that um, come through that conflict uh, with relationships intact and with the ability to work productively and collaboratively and creatively together, the more we just um, kind of support this, uh, you know, reality that conflict is a normal part of the human experience. Just what isn't a part of the normal human experience is inherently or instinctively knowing how to navigate it well. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Homo sapiens would just bonk each other on the heads with a stick or a stone when we disagreed with each other, and we really uh, we try not to do that in the modern workplace. So I can, mm-hmm. yeah, I can see that. Now, if I was going to put together a mediation program 
in an organization. You mentioned confidentiality, and I want to circle back to that, but what are the other key aspects to make that a a process that people trust? What else needs to be in a mediation program for the employees to really be willing to engage in it? People need to understand the value of the value of the process itself. I think they also need to understand that it is simply process, that the mediator's role is to hold the process and that it is a fully self-empowered process. So the mediator does it is not an arbitrator. The mediator doesn't come in and direct the outcome. There's no judgment. There's no um, blaming or shaming. It's a it, it's a framework that allows people to come together and really own their resolution. And when uh, when people who are experiencing conflict come together and co-create an agreement around what their relationship and their future will look like, co-create the um, the the ground rules or the guardrails for what that relation look, relationship will look like that agreement is far more um, sustainable than agreements that are um, you know placed on a person so mediation um, the mediator should not have any skin in the game meaning um, if if the parties don't come to resolution, they don't come to resolution. If they come to resolution, they come to resolution. It's not the mediator's role to um, to really have any uh, concern around if that happens. The, the whole job of the mediator is to hold a process so that it can happen um, and that the people who are involved are fully responsible for the creation of that agreement. Now, of course, as a mediator, we believe in the process and we feel really affirmed and grateful and happy when the parties do come to resolution. Um, but the goal itself isn't that a resolution happens. And so I think it's helpful for people to understand that it may not. It, it may not get there and there's no punishment for it not happening. Um, so... So I think part of getting people to buy into it is this is an opportunity with a potential for a resolution, but sometimes that's not what, um, sometimes conflict is surfacing to point us to something else. And, um, and mediation can, can be a pathway to finding that. So that neutrality is really important then, that, that, that the employees, for them to participate, that they understand that this mediator is neutral. So that means that the mediator is not going to come back to leadership and say, well, they didn't reach an agreement, but Susie is right. This guy's a jerk. Or, or these are the facts that I, you know, that, that came out and this is, you know, that weren't, und that were undisputed during the mediation. And, you know, he admitted that he said this, none of that's gonna, it's not like a workplace investigation where we're going to take action based on whatever the conversations were. That is such a great question. It is not a workplace investigation. So that question leads me to two things. Um, one is the mediator is not going to come back and say, you know, Susie's a jerk. Um, but what the mediator might come back with is there are some um, fault lines in your organizational system that are cultivating conflict. And so without breaching confidentiality, the mediator can point to how the system itself is operating in such a way that's actually bringing conflict forward. Um, so it can be so that in and of itself can be a really helpful way to get a lens on how the organizational system is functioning. That can be very helpful for leadership in terms of making some course corrections there. That would be like incentives, uh, bonus programs that encourage certain kinds of behavior, I guess, department rivalries, uh, leaders jockeying for position, things like that? Yes, um, things, exactly. Things like that, um, 
feedback mechanisms that maybe are not functioning as designed or as intended or a lack of feedback mechanisms that would be really helpful. Um, it could have to do with reporting structure. So um, for instance, I had a mediation one time where um, it was a, a very small team. It was a VP and two direct reports. And the way the VP had structured the reporting system is they both reported directly to her, but there were absolutely no opportunities for collaboration between the two team members. And, um, and the VP traveled all the time. It was A part of her job was that she had to be in a lot of different locations. And so they both kind of were just on an island and didn't feel support. And so one was relying heavily on the other person for that support. And the person that she was relying heavily on was like, it, it, you're not my responsibility. So just the reporting structure was was part of what was creating the conflict and so that was something that i could that i could feed back to the to the supervisor was um you have one person who needs a lot of collaboration and there isn't anyone there for her to to get that collaboration from and so more frequent one-on-ones would be really helpful um yeah, so sometimes it's a reporting structure. Sometimes it is um, a, another mediation that I had. It was brought up that um, the way that people this is it's so it, this is such a small thing, and it was a major blind spot. But the restroom was outside of the main floor of the um, office space. And they were going through a period of change and there were a lot of turnovers and people would go to the restroom and get locked out of the office. And it happened so frequently that it was creating a lot of anxiety in just the energy of the whole space. People were afraid to go to the restroom because they might get locked out if they forgot to bring their key card with them. So sometimes there's just something that's happening in the system that's creating unease in the people. And people who are experiencing unease often get into conflict. And mediators can, can feed that information back to leadership. And let's take a quick break. Good Morning HR is brought to you by Imperative. Premium background checks with fast and friendly service. For almost 25 years, Imperative has helped risk-averse clients make well-informed decisions about the people they involve in their business. This includes employees from the frontline operation all the way up to the C-suite, but we also provide due diligence investigations related to all sorts of business transactions. Accountants and other financial services firms rely on us to help them meet their know your customer and any money laundering responsibilities. Private investors often ask us to review the backgrounds of principals and key executives of investment targets. And clients considering joint ventures with other people or firms ask us to help them figure out who they're really getting in bed with. Basically, if there are people involved, there's risk involved. We help our clients mitigate that risk. If we can help you make better people decisions, please reach out to us at imperativeinfo.com. If you're an HRCI or SHRM certified professional, this episode of Good Morning HR has been pre-approved for a full recertification credit. To obtain the recertification information, visit goodmorninghr.com and click on Research Credits. Then select episode 125 and enter the keyword mediation. That's M-E-D-I-A-T-I-O-N. And now back to my conversation with Dr. Robin Short. So is in a, in, in a standard mediation program in the workplace is um, participation by, uh, in the process by the two parties in conflict, is that always voluntary or do, do you see policies that say, you know, when a manager directs this or when, when this conflict, you know, is true, you know, this mechanism is triggered at whatever point. And I'd be curious what that point is, how, how it gets started. But um, this is voluntary or this is automatic that, yeah, we're going to direct this to mediation and we're going to go through our process. Mediation should always be voluntary. So there should be a conflict resolution policy that makes mediation 
an available option. So it's a lever, it's a lever that an employee could pull, but it's not the only lever. And the and and that is important so because go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah, please go. Yeah, tell me why that's important, please. It's important because um, there there may be power dynamics where an individual doesn't feel psychologically safe or maybe even physically safe to go into mediation with a person that they're in conflict with. So it, it is I think mediation is a really effective conflict resolution um, tool, but it shouldn't be the only tool. And that leads me to something that I wanted to mention, which is sometimes people will reach out to me for mediation. And part of my process is that I um, do what I call perspective gathering conversations, where I talk with each of the people who are involved in the mediation. Uh, and sometimes I come to uh, I come to determine that mediation isn't actually the right tool. So it might be that someone in the organization knows about mediation, has an appreciation for it, and so will reach out for mediation, but it may not actually be the right tool for that conflict. Um, and so a mediator should be able to make that determination as to whether or not this is actually like we do need to have a conflict resolution intervention, but mediation isn't the, the one that I would recommend. So how do you know what the right, you know, that mediation is right for this conflict versus some other conflict resolution um, process? So it, it might be that there is a very clear victim and a very clear perpetrator. So someone, someone mm. is very specifically uh, perpetrating harm on another person and that person is clearly the victim. And in that and in that scenario, if both parties are willing, I would recommend a restorative justice process, which would be a process that is designed around um, repairing harm versus coming to a relationship agreement. Um, and that would really center the needs of the person who was harmed. It might also be that there are uh, that there is um, a conflict that's surfacing that really has more to do with one person's communication style. So it looks like a conflict between two people, but what's really happening is just that we have one person who really needs some development in in communication, and I might and I might uh, recommend. Um, just coaching for that one person, that there really isn't an agreement that needs to be made. We just have one person who could really do, use some upskilling in communication. Or it might be that in in um, in working through, you know, talking with everybody, it, it really looks like this is really just a leadership coaching opportunity. Um, because if we bring people together, there is no one thing that they need to come to resolution around. It's just, here's this person who's constantly causing friction. Um, and so there, there should be a, uh, I think of it as a conflict resolution toolkit that the mediator is drawing from and is able to bring the right, the right intervention to, to each conflict scenario. Makes perfect sense. When you, um, when, you know, let's say there's there's two people in an organization, maybe in two different departments, who have to work together and they're not getting along. And you know, there's the finger pointing and all of that stuff that we see. What is the what's the mechanism that triggers even the decision that hey, do we need to have uh, a mediation you know process in place or, or, or initiated in this in this circumstance? It is usually um, when the conflict is causing uh, productivity to stop. Like we are having a hard time actually getting our work done because this conflict is continuously intervening. When people find themselves engaging in the conflict itself and not the thing they've come together to do work with. so. I have um, a client that I'm working with right now 
their executive team. They have two people on the executive team that are experiencing a lot of interpersonal conflict. They cannot have an executive team meeting and actually get work-related work done because the conflict itself is always at the center. So um, it, it's, it is usually mediation is the right thing, uh, you know, the right intervention when it's just interfering with our ability to actually do our jobs, which is shockingly frequent. <laughs> and who pulls the pin? Who, who in, in an organization, who is it who's tasked with saying, we want to start this process because if I and this other person are in conflict, I'm right. They're wrong. I don't need mediation. Right. And um, mm -hmm. so who is it generally, you know, one of the managers who's got the authority to say, OK, we're going to, you know, we're going to, you know, go to DEF CON one or whatever and, and bring in, you know, start the mediation process. So typically HR has the authority. So what typically happens is the team lead will come to HR and make the request. HR identifies the mediator and does the logistics, right? Brings that person in as a contractor, but passes the relationship back to the team lead. And, um, and then mediation happens at that level. When I'm, my, uh, my general protocol is that I work directly with the team lead. I wanna keep HR actually on the sideline of the conflict um, for the sole purpose of cultivating psychological safety and trust in the process with the parties. So it usually is team lead goes to HR, HR identifies the mediator, brings them into the relationship and passes them back to the, uh, the team lead. However, there are times um, where the employee will actually go to their leader and request mediation, and then the leader goes to HR, and then it follows that same pathway. So the typical policy would would allow for you know any of the parties to suggest to ask for mm -hmm. it, and or some sort of leadership uh, in the chain of command, or somebody you know to take it to HR. So it just all depends on the dynamics of the relationships and really the comfort level with conflict of the manager. Um, but there have been times where um, the manager has reached out to HR, brought me into the scenario, and then asked that I reach out to the parties and invite them to mediation. So it could be very uh, you know, streamlined where the manager is communicating with the employees about the process and then introduces me, or it could be that I introduce myself to the employees and invite them to mediation. Interesting. So you mentioned confidentiality and, um, as a, you know, as a licensed private investigator who gets pulled in to employee relations things for clients to do investigations that, that aren't into, you know, malfeasance or anything like that, but they just have, you know, uh, you know, they need to know what are the facts really surrounding, you know, this dispute. Um, the first thing I always tell all the parties when I'm doing interviews is I, I can only guarantee confidentiality uh, to a certain extent, because certainly if this goes to litigation, there is no confidentiality. And I think that on the litigation side, if it's court-ordered mediation, there is some confidentiality guarantee there. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't be used as fact-finding, I believe. But in, in the workplace, whether it's an internal employee or they bring in an outside mediator, uh, I don't, does that, there's still that potential that whatever you say in mediation could show up in litigation. Is that right? Or am I, am I missing that? No, mediation is 100% confidential. So they will sign a agreement to mediate. And in that agreement, it states that the whole process is confidential, that everything said in mediation is confidential, and that the mediator cannot be called as a witness in court, and that none of the fact finding that's taken place in mediation can be used. It also states that the mediator will um, not retain any notes from mediation and that they are mm. agreeing to confidentiality with one another. So that is really part of the crucial piece of building trust in the process is that truly what happens in mediation stays in mediation. 
the only thing that is shared back to the organization is the agreement that they co-create and sign together. Okay, that's 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 educational. So that that I can see that lowering the resistance, um, mm-hmm. both of of the parties to the conflict, but also of the company. I mean, like you know, the company may be concerned if I if I've got mediation between a manager and an employee that the manager is going to say something to implicate implicate the company and and uh, you know in some bad act. And I I you know I don't I don't want that to to come back and bite me as a, as a company later. So knowing that, Mm -hmm. that all of that is everybody, everybody who's participating has said, you know, we're trying to solve this problem and this isn't going to be something that moves forward, uh, after this meeting, you know, that, that, that we're retaining, Mm -hmm. uh, the information or it's going to be used later for some other purpose. Yes, yes. And then also part of that agreement is that um, that they are agreeing to come to this in good faith to actually resolve um, the conflict. Now, I do need to add the caveat around confidentiality that mediators are um, do have responsibility to report if um, specific crimes are surfacing. So if there's child abuse that surfaces, you know, knowledge of child abuse that surfaces in mediation, um, there are a, there's a small handful of, of caveats around confidentiality that we would then have to report back to the police if, you know, something like that were to surface. But that's, that's also a part of the agreement so that they know that going into the mediation. So... If we wanted to develop inside an organization some trained mediators, are there specific, you know, personal behaviors, attributes that we would look for? And then what skills would, you know, they need to be developed to to effectively be a mediator? Obviously, mediation skills. But, I mean, what does that look like, mm-hmm. that training, you know, selecting those people and training those people? So the selecting piece, um, I would say that if if an organization wanted to develop a peer mediation program, you want to identify individuals in the organization who already have good communication skills, high emotional intelligence skills, um, high levels of self-awareness, and ideally high levels of cultural intelligence. Um, So I would say those are just some baseline skills that are gonna be important for mediators to have. All of those things you can develop. Um, So people going into mediation training may not necessarily already have those skills, but they're gonna be really critical skills for mediation. So selecting individuals in the organization who have those skills. You also want to select people who have um, high social capital, um, people who are trusted by their peers so that people would actually come to them, you know, in a peer mediation process. And then when you go through mediation, you spend a lot of time developing skills around active listening, um, reframing, really getting to um, uh, utilizing, you know, this art of developing questions that will support people in getting to the root of what they're really arguing about. So typically, um, the thing we say we're arguing about is probably not really what it is. There's something deeper underneath it that's driving this conflict. Um, so people who so so the mediation is uh, training is going to help you in sort of developing these artful questions that will help to shape the dialogue, and um, then also um, the skill that I. Uh, call listening with your whole body, which is really around developing the, 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 the internal emotional regulation skills and social regulation skills to kind of read the room and know when you need to lean into silence and when you need to lean into questioning and how to support people in really navigating um, sitting together in discomfort. How long is that that peer training? How long does that take? Um, 
well, how's it normally structured? If a company was going to consider doing that, what is that? What is that? What kind of investment am I making in my employees' time and effort to to develop mm-hmm. this cadre of of peer mediators? So mediation training will take, um, it's a 40 hour training program for basic mediation training. And um, so, so peer to peer, so the mediators would go through a 40 hour training um, uh, process. And then there would be some time invested from an uh, HR perspective or an employee relation perspective and just designing that process itself. And then there would be some investment in terms of time and resources in the messaging and communicating it out to the organization so that you can begin to condition people into um, the awareness that it exists and sort of norm- normalizing um activating that. Um, But then mediators in that mediation process, um, they're going to do a lot of role playing. But in addition to the 40 hours, it would be helpful to bake in probably, you know, an additional 40 hours would be ideal, but at least probably 16 additional hours to give each of those mediators time to observe a real life mediation so that they can see one in action before they just step in and start mediating. And at the end of that training, is there a certification? Is there a national sort of certifying body that somebody would have have a certification from? Or is that a bigger investment of time? Or how does that work? So um, each state, so the state of Texas has um, requirements around what uh, must be embedded in a mediation training in order for it to you for you to qualify as a mediator, but there is not an official governing body of uh, that regulates the mediation industry, and so there are professional associations that self-regulate the industry. So in Texas, that's the Texas Roundtable of Mediators, and the Texas Roundtable of Mediators. Um, have put together a standard mediation um, in order for your mediation training to be recognized by Texas Roundtable of Mediators. It will meet all of these criteria, um, which the mediation programs, you know, a, a reputable one will bake into that. Um, but there isn't an official an official regulator of the mediation industry. So you want to look for, in Texas, you want to look for um, a mediator training that is utilizing the Texas Roundtable because that's the that's the in in Texas mediators look to that as um, our self regulating body. And other states would have a similar kind of organization uh, that's specific to to that that jurisdiction. Yes, yes, and then usually. Uh, mediators will, so this would, you know, not really apply to if you're, if you're building a peer mediation program, but mediators will usually specialize in a particular industry. Um, so if you were looking for a mediator, a third party mediator, you might, um, you know, there's mediators that focus in workplace mediation, people who focus in family mediation, people who focus in, um, uh, you know, civil disputes. So you would want to look for a mediator that's going to have an area of expertise that's related to your industry or your, or the conflict itself. And and you definitely want to make sure that whoever you're using, if it's a third party, also has that mediation certification. And I would tell any employer now, knowing this, if I were talking to them and they wanted to do a peer system, make sure because that certification exists and you want this to be a defensible mm-hmm. process down the road and have the trust of your employees, make sure that even your peers do get that certification. So it's not just, oh, well, everybody likes Joe and he's an impartial guy, so let's have him sit in on this meeting and, and do this because the structure won't be there to ensure confidentiality. And uh, and sometimes we don't really know how trustworthy Joe is uh, until you know uh, and what his problem-solving skills might be uh, with that conflict. So definitely it sounds like Make sure, just like if you're having an invest, you know, if you've got some people doing an outside investigator coming in or you're doing internal investigations, you want to make sure that those people know what they're doing and have the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, one last question. This is my French goodbye because, you know, I say the last question. We'll see where it takes us. But um, so many of employees have employers have hybrid 
uh, work work uh, working environments or completely remote, mm-hmm. have you seen unique conflicts coming out of that? And how does mediation work when everybody's remote? Mm-hmm. So the unique conflicts that I am seeing surface around fully remote work environments is um, people are struggling to really understand the scope of a conflict because I can only access the narrative you're telling me. Um, And so what I mean by that is in the old days where we all went into a building to do our work, there was a lot of information that you picked up on as you moved around the building. You could understand the dynamics of people's relationships because you were physically present in all the things that were happening outside of us just being in a meeting together. And so what's happening now in these fully remote environments is conflicts are surfacing, but the manager or the HR person or the colleague has a hard time really grasping what is actually happening because we only see each other in Zoom. So I only see you in the meeting and I only have access to that information. So these fully remote environments Um, There is just an information barrier that is um, causing people to not be able to fully grasp or understand what the conflict is really about. And so that has created some confusion as people are trying to navigate just their, you know, interpersonal relationships in this remote world that we're living in. In terms of mediation, prior to the pandemic. I mean, online mediation has been a thing, you know, for years, but I always believed very firmly that mediation had to take place in person. I wasn't the least bit interested in online mediation. When the pandemic happened, I had several mediations lined up and I had to really quickly go through training to actually upskill myself and knowing how to do online mediation. And I was absolutely shocked by how effective it is. Doing online mediation creates a lot of it just there's a lot of baked in safety that people have because they're in their own home, they're in their own space, and they're able to regulate themselves a little bit better in the mediation process. And because we haven't had to like drive to a building and um, you know, kind of spend all this time removing ourselves from work to get to the mediation. Instead of sitting down and trying to hash out this mediation in eight hours, we can do it in smaller pieces. So we can do a portion of it for two hours and then take a break and come back a week later and do, you know, another two hours. And in between these sessions, I can give people homework assignments, things that they can reflect on and think about. So I have actually found online mediation to be remarkably successful. The only time that I'm intentional about this mediation really needs to happen in person is if there's too many people involved. If there's really more than eight people involved in the mediation, then I want us to get together in a room because I actually, as a mediator, have a hard time holding that kind of energy in tiny boxes on a computer. Um, sure. it, it starts to lose its effectiveness if you have too many people. But if it's a small group of people, Online is, um, I, I've just been really delighted by how effective it is. Well, that's so interesting. And, and we've gone way over the time you, you promised me. So I really do appreciate that. I will have all of Dr. Robin Short's contact information in the show notes and on the goodmorninghr.com website. But thank you, Robin, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It was an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for listening. You can comment on this episode or search our previous episodes at goodmorninghr.com or on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcast. Rob Upchurch is our technical producer, and you can reach him at robmakespods.com. And as always, thank you to Imperatives Marketing Coordinator, Marianne Hernandez, who keeps the trains running on time. I'm Mike Coffey. Please don't hesitate to reach out if I can be of service to you personally or professionally. 
I'll see you next week. And until then, be well, do good, and keep your chin up.